The information wars are raging, and real, reliable information is getting lost in a blizzard of BS. BS that's designed to deceive you. And most of the misinformation is not coming from Russian trolls, meddlers, or other foreign governments. Yeah, that's a problem, but most of this stuff is coming from right in our own backyards. In America, it is fellow Americans peddling smears and racism. In China, it's the Chinese government spewing propaganda. And in India, well, here's a quote from Facebook's former security chief saying, in India, the disinformation is being driven by India's political parties. All around the world, this is a growing problem. Hundreds of years ago, newspaper owners and pamphleteers were able to spread lies. The difference now is the speed and the reach and the allure of the internet. Information is being weaponized. The tension is being hijacked. And all of us are really just starting to adapt. It was a lot easier in these days than it is today. The world is very murky, but there is a dividing line, and I want us to keep it in mind in this entire program today. I think it's between the people who are trying to be constructive and careful, caring about truth, accountable to an editor or a boss or someone, versus people who are unaccountable, destructive, you know, caring only about uh, winning uh, the information war. Constructive versus destructive. That is the dividing line. That brings me, of course, to President Trump. Trump creates such a flurry of misinformation that the truth melts away like an ice cube on a summer day. I could show you a hundred examples, but here's just one from this week. Out of nowhere, Trump retweeted a really loyal Trump superfan who posted this the day after the Charlottesville riot. She wrote here, these protests are not spontaneous, they're pre-manufactured by OFA. She means Obama. And then she linked to a Lou Dobbs segment from Fox Business. This is lunacy. A Twitter user who spends all day sharing pro-Trump, anti-immigrant memes, picks up a Fox segment, uses it, okay, to claim white supremacist violence was actually Obama's fault to take the heat off Trump. And the president retweeted it two years later, and no one even bat an eyelash because Trump says so much, and the web is so chaotic, and it's all so crazy that it's just background noise in this never-ending information battle. That's what I mean when I say there's an information war going on. None of this is journalism. These memes, these smears, this crap has no relationship to journalism. But journalists have to grapple with this misinformation muck, what we used to call fake news, actually fake stories designed to deceive you. Because otherwise, the result is uninformed, ill-informed readers. We saw this at the White House social media summit that wasn't. Did you hear about this a few days ago? It was a clear stunt by the president. He was ridiculing reporters while inviting in internet trolls and far-right Twitter personalities and fringe radio hosts to the White House, uh, in some ways maybe a, a campaign rally for 2020. It was tempting to say we should just ignore this event and call it a stunt and move on, but something important was happening. Trump was legitimizing provocateurs and, and in some cases extremists to deliberately spread misinformation. It felt to me like he was preparing his 2020 meme corpse, you know, the folks that make those visual images that spread all across Facebook and go viral. As Charlie Warzel of the New York Times put it, the summit suggests that 2016's meme army was just proof of concept for an information war in 2020. Warzel said, whatever is coming, we're not prepared. I think what he means by we is newsrooms, media companies, the people that try to make sense of the world for you. It felt to me the summit was a, a campaign 2020 strategy session with Trump's hand-picked press corps. But the attendees don't work for newsrooms. In most cases, they don't have editors who have been trained in journalistic standards. What they do is they promote the president. They promote his brand. They promote his agenda, uh, sometimes through conspiracy theories and misinformation. Now, I'm not trying to lump everybody in together, but that is what we see oftentimes on the pro-Trump web. Now, at the same time, disinformation knows no political party. There are liberals, there are Democrats getting away with all sorts of smears as well. But we see it constantly on the right. People like Jim Hoft, he's the founder of the right-wing website called The Gateway Pundit. Just one of many examples of a website that, that specializes in this kind of misinformation that confuses people, okay? Putting up lies right here, saying that recently Obama was responsible for removing the citizenship question on the census. That's obviously not true, it's false. Uh, there were lots of other uh, webs uh, are examples on this website uh, of smears and false information that's been spread. But the Gateway Pundit is just one of many examples of this. Here's the bigger story. And uh, you got to be honest, I, I want to take a minute here and, and try to talk you through this before we bring in the panel. These smears 
these lies, this misinformation that comes mostly on the right from pro-Trump websites, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, supported by television hosts, radio hosts. They are softening the ground for straight up racism out of the president's Twitter account. And that is what we are seeing today. This is one of the president's most recent tweets, straight up racist talking about progressive congresswomen. Let, let's read part of it here. He says, it's so interesting to see Democratic congresswomen, uh, we'll put it back up in a sec, uh, who, who originally came from countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, uh, now loudly, viciously telling the people of the United States how to run the government. Here's the key part. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime-fested places from which they came? Now, He's probably talking about Representative Ilhan Omar, who was born in Somalia, who fled to Kenya, and then came to the United States when she was 12 years old. There are other Democratic congressmen, uh, congresswomen who, who she is uh, associated with, uh, who she is friendly with, uh, all of whom were born in the United States. But the president's talking about Democratic congresswomen who need to go back to where they're from. It's 2019, we're two and a half years into the Trump presidency, and his racism is becoming more obvious, more frightening. There are millions of Americans, black and brown Americans, who know exactly what he means when he says, go back to where you came from. They've heard those words on the schoolyard, behind their backs at work. That kind of racism that Americans have been fighting against for decades is coming from the president's Twitter feed. There's no bigger story in the country right now. And I want to relate this to the media by pointing out that the ground has been softened for this stuff from the president by this collection of pro-Trump bloggers, radio hosts, television stars, who somehow think it's acceptable to attack fellow Americans like this. Let's talk about these information wars and a lot more. Again, a special edition of the program, and I've got a special panel to start us off. Former senior advisor to national security, uh, to national security advisor under Obama, the CNN national security analyst Sam Vinograd is here. Robbie Suave is an associate editor at Reason Magazine, and he's the author of Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump. And from Vox, senior, media, uh, senior politics reporter Jane Coatston. Jane, let me start with you. The president's tweets uh, I view as part of this information war that's raging. And obviously he posts so much so often, and that's part of his strategy. But are today's tweets different at all? I mean, I think we can all remember the Judge Curiel incident of 2016 mm. uh, to know that this is not new, that President Trump's views of who is adequately American uh, are, shall we say, different from my own. But I think that it's reflective of this understanding that to criticize this country means that you are no longer able to be a representative of this country, which is a very strange thing for someone who in 2015 described America as a hellhole to do. Hmm. And I think that it's, it's interesting, though, that this hasn't changed. You know, this is the same language he used about Judge Curiel of hmm. Indiana. This is the same language he's used again and again and again. You don't think the racism is getting more explicit in some cases? I think if you've been paying attention, this is just kind of the basic way in which he talks about mm. people with whom, who, who don't follow him. You know, I think that there's an understanding of Trump, and I think one of the challenges we have is that we are, you know, you're going to start seeing a lot of people attempt to defend these tweets by arguing that, no, 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 he just meant this one representative, he, ju he just meant this, maybe he did mean go back to Cincinnati, but, you know, <laughs> you're going to start to see right. that back and forth, yeah. that back and forth, but the thing is, what is at the root of this is an understanding that if you criticize how this country works, you are no longer... It, you know, you're no longer acceptable to the president, and you're no longer available to continue in the work that you're doing. Yeah, or as American as the rest. Right. Robbie, how do you view it? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a shameful uh, that this faction of the pro-Trump right has seemed to actually embrace identity politics, something the right has long criticized as being bad for this country. Uh, but they, they have embraced it as now, you know, if you, if you look different or you're from somewhere else, that defines you and thus we're going to criticize you on that grounds and that's again that's a thing that the right used to be really against or at least claim purportedly to be against hmm. and now it's it's driving and defining so much of their of their criticism of other people and again Trump ran on that was like I'm gonna be anti-identity politics political right. correctness is killing us all right. that kind of stuff but of course uh, like so many criticisms of that you know he is what he purports to criticize